have, we're going to talk about, we're moving on, I'm going to have to adapt myself, so I'm going to have to hurry up, I dragged on the first part, so I'm going to have to really speed up now. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to touch on <coughs> complexity, so uh, in the context of the cloud, the, the, there's two dimensions that we have to consider, space and time, and space I'm talking about, think of it like the state space or the resource space, basically the size, what our capacity itself within the application. So if you think about the cloud, you're talking about the number of network elements that you have, the network nodes. So take your application, you can suddenly go from 10 JVMs to 1000 JVMs. And it could be a matter of seconds or minutes within particular clouds. So there's this suddenly, so our size, can we can really scale now in the cloud environment itself. And then there's also the time aspect too of this, is that we can do it much quicker and we're changing everything quicker. Not just changing the, the space itself much quicker, we're changing our applications, the behavior. And there's also a lot more diversity in the system. So the capacity that, that we do get in the cloud might not be all homogenous. We might be getting different types of hardware, different types of, we might have noisy neighbors on particular servers. So we can't even guarantee that even if we have two of the same nodes, that they have the same performance uh, profile for us, the profile in terms of what they can give us. Uh, so it's changing quicker. This, this size is huge. We can have we have to be tasked with managing. There's like companies. I just with a, I was just doing a conference in in Australia, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, "I've got seventy five thousand JVMs to manage." 75,000 JVMs, and you probably all know this company. You know, you're probably using their issue tracking system or something, but they have 75,000 JVMs in their cloud. So, how do you manage something like that? How do you know when there's a problem? Or how do you know what it is? So you have a huge size and then the time, it's changing. So, uh, any, so at that scale, how do you go around pinging 75,000 JVMs and saying, what are you doing? And then resolve a problem, and then try to determine whether the problem is related to the other guys, if they're having a similar problem. Because there's a latency as you loop around these. So by the time you get to the, the last one of those 75,000 JVMs, everything else has changed. Mm -hmm. Someone might have even deployed a new app. So. We, we can't manage it. That's the issue. So this is a, from a company, Netflix. They're very big in the cloud. They don't use our tool. But they do have it. Uh, they use another competitor's tool. But this is what their software looks like in terms of a dashboard or di di diagnostics. This is their services. They have services calling services. Now, they say this is management. Now, I look at it and I say, there's no way you're managing that. You're probably seeing something flashing like green. But if you go into any typical op center and you get a big dashboard and it goes red, let's say there's some kind of circle somewhere, typically there's big red and green circles, and there's a green circle and suddenly goes red. What do you think people do? What do people do? They wait for it to go green. <laughs> Honestly, what can you do? You're like, Gonna go green any minute now. I don't think. <laughs> any minute now, and then okay, it's not going green. What do we do? What is the most common operation that operations do to JVMs today? Stop, stop. Kill. They even have jobs to schedule it. It's like kill them in the morning. It's like we we don't know how to control these JVMs, so we just kill them, and then hopefully the memory leak doesn't come, and we'll kill it before it happens again. <laughs> and we restart it. We have companies who restart JVMs every morning because they can't find the memory leak. But they know after about three days it will happen. So they just kill it every day <laughs> and restart the new one because they can't fix the problem. And that's a typical way we manage software today. And so what can operations do? Because they simply the problem is they have no control. You haven't given them any control mechanism. The only control is they have is kill. They can't say to the software, can you slow down? Because I think you're going to kill yourself. The software's like, I'm running, there's a request, I keep going. I don't stop until the garbage collector stops me. And then if he keeps cycling, I'll probably eventually kill, kill myself anyway, because I'll be just spinning around. So 
Today, the, the only mechanism that JVMs have, or applications have, to throttle the behavior, to alter the behavior, is GC. GC is your friend. I mean, like, more GC is better, because I'm slowing down. <laughs> of course, the problem is, is when you have too much of it, and you get close to that. And in resilient systems, what we need to find is where our limits are, and then drop down. So we typically, a resilient system is very dynamic. You know, we're kind of, we're going up and down, it's like our temperature goes up and down, but we know there is a limit, so when, once we go over that limit, we don't come back. But today, applications, does any, any of you have a, a web app that goes, I just received a request, I should look what I'm just doing now, I don't think I can handle it, I'll slow down at the moment and then I'll run ahead when it's ready. No, none of the apps do it today, they just say, thanks, I'm going. That's straight to the database. And everybody else is at the database waiting. It's like, we're waiting, queue up behind us. And then what happens then, we have all of these threads at the database, waiting, and they're all holding memory. They're all, all on the call stack. Everybody knew there wasn't capacity. Let's say the database is a bottleneck. And just ignoring that the database is just slow anyway. Just let's say, let's say the database is a bottleneck because you're just sending too many requests to it. Because no one is slowing down. Everybody says, let's keep going until something crashes. I mean, that's what some JVMs do. They're kind of like, as fast as possible until we crash. But what we need to do is say, look ahead and say, God, there's a big pile up down there. Why do I want to run down and join that queue? Maybe I should stop now and ease off a little bit. That's what we do when we're, we're, we're taxing our systems. We kind of ease off, like slow down. I'm going too fast. Now, software is like, I'm, I am i don't know where I'm going. I'm just going ahead. <laughs> I'm hitting the car in front of me. <laughs> And, and, and that's our software. Our software has no awareness of what it does and doesn't even know what it did just pre previously. It's like, like, let's say when it starts to go slow, the GC starts to slow it down. You would think it'd say, hey, we should probably slow it. We shouldn't let more threads go through because we're doing a lot of GC. No, it just does it again. It goes in and says, I've got a job. I'm, going, I'm running ahead. I'm going to create more garbage. And they're going to slow everybody else down too. So our software, has because it has no awareness of what it does, and it has no control mechanism and it doesn't even think about it. It's like, okay, take, just to give you an example, like another example is like, take your web app. Like, or like, let's say you have a car dealer or a car service and you get bad service. You go to a dealer one day and you say, I've got my car, I'd like to service it. And he keeps you there for four hours when he should have probably kept you only for two hours or something. And you're really pissed off with it. And you make a complaint to the manager. Now the next time you go for a car service, what do you expect? You expect to be you know, the red carpet to be laid out. You know, you expect that behavior to change. Now, when a user uses your web app and he gets a slow request, what's the probability that the next request is going to be slow? Has it in all, is it, in, is it independent or not of the previous request? It's completely independent. The software doesn't care. Yeah. It doesn't even know. It doesn't say, hey, I was slow for you the last time. Don't worry about it. I'll go fast this time. <laughs> It doesn't do that, but humans expect it. So when I get bad service, the next time, I'm happy if the service gets better. Have you ever noticed when you go to a web app or a web page, and it's a bit slow, but the next page is fast, and then you're kind of like, oh, well, if you're a geek, you're probably saying, oh, it's preloading stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're not, you're just like, oh, it's okay, you just had one slow, but the next page is fast. You kind of forget about that. But what happens when the next page is slower, and then you get slow again? Then you start to get irritated. This software sucks because it's always slow. And of course, it's probably being just a, a consecutively slow for a short period of time. The majority of the time, it could have been fast. But there was a period when it went slow. And it was more noticeable, and you couldn't forgive it quick enough. So what our software needs to do is say, you know what, this user got a bad service. I'm going to do a bit better for him the next time. And then everybody else is happier. So we have to build software that's more human-like in terms of our behavior, that what we expect is poor service gets changed the next time we do it, that it does it faster. Of course, it can't do it faster than it, it possibly can, but it might mean scheduling or might mean prioritization. It might say, listen, I'm going to put you ahead of the queue. Wouldn't you expect that too? It's like you get your, 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 your loyalty card when you come in and into you know, an airline, you expect to go into the fast lane. And that software doesn't really have a fast lane today. It's like everybody's on the lane. And so we need the software to do that. Now, so complexity, of course, of course, we need to figure out what it's doing. And it gets harder with the cloud because what we feel is going to come is mobility of code. So today it's a bit easier where your code is just running in one web container and maybe calling to another service. 
Well, what's going to happen in the future is like typically this is what we have today. You have a web, maybe an application in the cloud, and it might be using some other cloud service like a storage service, S3 or a queuing system, SQS or something like that. And it's, you, it's calling an API, and it's typically via HTTP or, you know, or a REST API, and it makes a call. But the future is more going to be more like, instead of us saying, because uh, this, is, this is like the database, you know, we went through this with the database. We had SQL, and then we had store procedures, or, you know, we sent code. We, well, code was already preloaded into the database. So what we're going to have is, we're going to have, because this, this really doesn't scale. I mean, it's scaling now, but it will reach its limits. And what we will move to is where our code figures out it should go closer to the data. So it's like, okay, I'd like to go over to this web uh, API and send some code and say, listen, can I execute the following local within your, within your environment? So today you can make a request to Twitter, but really what you want to do is say, here's a piece of code, Twitter, can I run it in your environment against my profile or something and collect the data and come back? Because you don't want to be pulling all the data back over the network you want to send your code over, do the work there, and get it, and then get out of there. Or you might use that to then to navigate to another service, to take the data that's in the environment. So what we're going to, to address this, we're going to have to move where we go to, and maybe this code, code mobility, you might think it's a bit like, well, that sounds a bit crazy, but we're already doing that today with browsers. Browsers download JavaScript code and execute in their environment, because that's where the rendering has to be there. So we're, so, Eventually, we're going to have to be pushing the code backwards down over to these APIs that we have, the open API, and getting the code to local. So think about EJBs. Remember we had those EJB remote interfaces, and then we had local interfaces, and that's what's probably going to happen with the web. We have kind of, we're more remote-based now, but in the future, it's going to be, you can have remote or local, so you can send some code and get a local API context and be able to execute against that there. And it might be just a model and XML within that environment. Now what's going to happen is that those providers are going to have to execute your code. Now if they're executing your code, they're going to have to protect their systems because your code could run away. It could just keep running. So with those kind of environments, if we start to accept code coming in, so we're going to start having open APIs. We're going to have to start having open kind of containers where people, the application is mobile, part of the code come over. So think about the matrix, it's like dial me in, I'm coming. <laughs> And that's where we're heading. So we're, the, the code's going to go over there. And if the code gets executed in this in runtime, we have to control it. We have to figure out when we should kill it. There's a job running and say, okay, you're going, you're, well, you're over your limits. And we have kind of already limits with Twitter and APIs where you don't call them, if you, don't, you can only call them within rate limits. But we're going to have to have a code where you move your code over and then it gets a budget. And then as soon as it goes past that budget, it's kicked out. And an example of this is Salesforce. Salesforce today gives you a web application, a kind of a platform where you can upload your code, your Apex of code or something like that. And it's a kind of like, I think it's a bit like Java, or has anybody ever used that code or something? But it's very similar. And they, while it's run in a JVM, and you upload the code, and that's business logic that's applied to the Salesforce application. So it's a bit like a custom module where you enhance a system. And we're going to get to that stage where we're going to move that over. And if you're going to be a provider of a cloud service, you're going to have to accept that code coming in, and you're going to have to have a means to stop it, to control it, to figure out what it's doing, and then to decide whether you want to kick it out or not. And that's so to prioritize, because you're going to have some customers who are paying customers, and some customers who are not paying customers. And you want them to be scheduled differently. So that's the kind of complexity we have. Now, of course, when we move to that with the cloud, we're going to have a chain of services. Can people see this on the TVs, yeah? They're up there, yeah? Because I just see someone like looking down the back. <laughs> I was like, why are you not looking at the TV? <laughs> so, oh, this is probably quite bad. Uh, the, the graphics not coming out. But basically, think of Salesforce as an API. When you call the Salesforce today, or think about when your manager comes and does it, uh, you ask you to do a job. You do a job, and then you typically give him, you give him a kind of a, after you finish the job, you give him a breakdown of what you did, or what the cost was. This is how long I took doing this, this is how long I took doing that, this is the other resources I consumed, and this was the cost in doing that. I had to buy this amount of hardware, and I had to use this amount of man, you know, man errors. So when we make API calls to software, software is going to have to start reporting back to us what it did. Now why is that important? 
So take this example of a client calling into Salesforce. This is a web app, right? you just can't see it now. And what we want is when we get a response from him, we want him to tell us how long he took, what the CPU time was, what the bytes, and what the charge unit. And the reason we want that is because he's going to charge us. Later on, you're going to get billed. Amazon charges you for bytes, for CPU time. You want to know, if you're going to make the call, what's the charges that you're going to get. And, the, and the, what's important, what's also useful about that, if he sends back the clock time to you, and you're measuring the clock time here, you can determine what the network issue is. Because it's like when you ring up a, a system saying, I didn't get my books. When did it leave? How long does it take to leave your factory or your, you know, your warehouse? If, if, if Amazon is sending you the, the docket when we left, then you, and then you know when it came to your house, you know, the, the in-between is the logistics system itself. So, with when we call into services, today we don't want them just to perform a function, we want them to tell us what they did. And it's like your manager, he goes up and says, did you complete that job? You say yes, but does he not ever say, did, how did it go? Was it good? Was it bad? Did it take longer than you expected? You know, those kind of questions. We don't ask software today, we just say, give us the answer take it and then that's it. You, what software has to come back from now on is actually bring back data that tells us, you know what, I was a bit, I can't do this at the moment or I'm too busy or that's a really kind of have a little bit on HP. But like I did a job but there are reasons for being slow. So when we, and your manager asks you for your assessment or you know your reasons why it, it delayed, you give them a breakdown. You have reasons, you have excuses. And today, the software only returns results, and we want more data than that. Give an example like HashMap. And this is very like Java, like, when you do HashMap get, what happens with HashMap get? Does there, anybody know what happens with, when you call HashMap get? We do a hash code, yeah, just okay, and then we look up a table, and then what do we typically do? Scan, don't we? We scan along the linked, typically it's a table, and it's a head, and then there's a linked list. That's the typical kind of mechanism. Now, what happens when the when you and, and the map get is slow? What could be the factor to that? What could be causing map get to be slow? Other than your hash code. Too many, uh, too many linked lists. There are too many collisions where we have it and then the linked list. It's like what we had recently with JVM, where there was a you know an attack, a security issue because of people hashing, having the same hash code in in, in, in Yeah. So now now what's the problem with the hash map? The hash map is not telling us what it did. The hash map didn't say to us, here's the result, but I hit 10 lists. It took me a bit longer because I had to go through 10 of them, or I had to go through a thousand. So if hash map instead of just said, here's the result, it also said, by the way, I scanned over a linked list of a size 10,000, then what would your software do? Kill the JVM? <laughs> log it. Yeah, I know you want to log it. <laughs> well, you want to be at least aware of it, and, and the reason is because then you can understand why, why it goes slow. Because you could use that number and say that every time it goes slow, I happen to be always doing. Let, let's say your software was dumb and it didn't understand hash map. But let's say hash map, every time it, it does a job, it gives you two items. It gives you the result, and it told you the number of linked linked items is scanned. Now, you could easily correlate slow, high linked list. Yeah? So what the reason we can't do that today is because the software is not exposing a signal or some observation that will help us. But if you if your manager asked the question, you would have an excuse. I was delayed because I was waiting for that guy. Or I had to do more than this. It took longer to do that. But software today just says I've done it. And it doesn't tell us what it did. It just says, here's the result. And so we need the software not just to give us a result. So when we call the Salesforce, we need it to bring back the response and payload, tell us what it's doing. And then we can use that here to assess whether it's a network issue or whether it's the service itself. Unless, of course, you could lie. But we're going to assume there's some trust <laughs> in this environment. Now, let's say one guy uses another guy. So let's say I'm communicating with Salesforce and say, I say to Salesforce, listen, I own my data. So every time you create data for me, I want you to put, put it in S3, Amazon. 
I don't want you storing your data in Salesforce because if you go, I haven't got my data. You know, so I want my data separate, externalized to something, and then maybe I can migrate later. So, so Salesforce says, okay, I'll do it. I'll call to your S3, but S3 sucks. You know, it's slow. And every time I'm slow, I'm going to blame it on it. So what, how we could resolve that in supply chain management is that typically what we want is that when we tell Salesforce, give me or do something, Salesforce goes to our database, you know, it says, okay, I have to go to the database. Oh, this database is S3. Communicates with Amazon. Now, Amazon sends over its clock time, its bytes, because it's charging us based on the bytes and maybe the cost for every interaction. <coughs> now, what Salesforce then does is aggregates that within the, within the request and then puts inside its payload, its data, and then it puts its data related to S3. So this is what S3 reported. So S3 told me the clock time was this, then, and then maybe even the number of times that I went to S3. So now what happens when there's a problem? At the client. So let's say the client says, I want to know what my system is doing. All it has to look at is the last response, because the last response has the payload or the, re the responses from everybody. We don't need to say to ring up Salesforce, listen Salesforce, I need to install a Java agent because I've got a bottleneck and I need to figure out where it is. You don't even have to ring up Amazon. If Amazon and Salesforce report the observations back along with the responses, we can determine where the bottleneck is in the network or in the network of services. Don't think of it as just a network, but just think of a supply chain. So when we communicate with S3 and S3 talks it, as, uh, sorry, when we communicate with Salesforce and it talks to S3, we have enough data, we know the clock time here, we know the clock time in Salesforce, and we know the clock time in the client. We can determine whether the bottleneck is here or whether it's here, or whether it's in here itself, or here. And that's just from the last response. So if everybody gave us a kind of a docket, at the end, we just have to look at one docket and understand the whole system, yeah? So that's what we want the software. Now, of course, we could then put that in some kind of a system. So we're going to move on to control, but I, just to give you an example, what does a docket look like in terms of Java? I just read some code here. Uh, so this is our, our, our code, our call code here. Remember the call? That call? You know, we call here. And then we, I've added a method here where call is calling leaf, and this does nothing, yeah? I could just sleep here. Now, I'm going to make the software find out what's happening in its environment. So what I'm, I'm doing here, on, on this line here, I'm saying probes context is like the thread context. Give me the thread. And then I'm going to say, I want to create a save point. I want to say is that this is a save point in the system in terms of metering. Yeah? And then I'm going to do some work. And then at the end, I'm going to compare the thread's behavior, or what he's recorded up to now, with the, the save point I've saved already, you know, that marker. And then I wanted to generate what's changed. I want to tell me, tell me what's changed since that time and this time. And then I want to loop through that change. So what would that look? That's like back to what we had with Amazon, isn't it? So we could just say, tell me, save, say, okay, this is a marker, mark some point in time, mark it again, and say, tell me what changed in the environment. Now at the thread level, because we want the thread, we want to know what the thread's doing, because we want to know what the behavior is underneath us. Yeah? Okay, let, I'll show you what the output looks like and then we go back and look at the code. So if I run that, and I'm gonna then change, of course, the so call is gonna call leaf and leaf is gonna be called, so. You can see there that it's reported samples A was called there 10,000 times, 100,000 times and the leaf. If I change just to show you, I haven't done some magic there. Or I have done magic. Um, let's just, I'm going to add another method in, so the software then, if I just say, let's say the software, because we're not in control of the software or what Leaf does. So if Leaf then later on just said, okay, I'm going to change myself, uh, 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 sorry, term, just say I'll call term, and let's say I'll do that twice. I'm going to save it, compile it, run it. Uh, can you see it, by the way? 
Yeah. Okay, so what it's reported is samples A call 100,000 times, leave and term. Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, why did I only say that one? I should have called it. I've, I've done something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm using the wrong. Uh, yeah. I think we've disabled it. Oh, you know what it is? Intelligent metering. <laughs> uh, I was awake this time. No, no, we've disabled our measurement. Uh, uh, I probably have, uh, sorry. Sorry, I just have to move the mic up. Where am I going? System dynamics. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I go to my code, that's the problem there. <laughs> because what happened is we disabled leaf. <laughs> so it did execute, but after a while we stopped, we, after a while we stopped executing the term. Yeah, so if I do now, of course I could just disable the strategy. It's slower now because now the, the warm-up is, you know, we're not, we're not disabling the code. What? <laughs> okay, hold on a second. Oh, because I've raised the higher, yeah, yeah, of course. I'm going to disable strategy altogether. Hold on, where's the strategy? Yeah, because it's, got, it's just gone through a thousand because I've got it up here too, too big of a number. <laughs> <coughs> so, hold on. I'll bring this down a bit, just show us a thousand. <laughs> okay. Trust me, it'll work. Okay, so you can see there, there's multiple samples. Two, one. The reason why it only did once the last time, because it did one wrong, and then everything was disabled, so the next time it wasn't able to observe. Yeah? The reason it's multiplying is because the me measurement is is now still on, so now the metering is happening. So what's happening there is, is I'm generating sales call 1000, sales leave 1000, sales term 2000. The reason why the previous one didn't run, right, and you only see one line, is because that was one big run, and then everything else delete, di disabled. And then when we did a chain set, there was nothing in the chain set, because nothing changed, because we stopped measuring it. Yeah? And that's good. It looked, it was bad in a demo. <laughs> when you're like, put the... <laughs> But it's good in behavior because what we want is for the intelligence system to only give us the essence of what it is. So with the and that's so what we want is the measurement to be intelligent and then for our our ability to observe what changes in our environment. So getting back to that, now the software, our software can now understand what it does. It could say, "Hey, I know what I do." I could, and over time, it could use that chain set and, and create a profile per method and say, did this method always cause the database? And it's able to look down all of the stack. It doesn't matter where these methods were called. If I had it called into another class, they would have appeared in the chain set. And so now I, I, I can go to any method at the top level and say, I want to know what I'm doing. And all I have to do is save, point, and then do a compare and generate the behavior. So what are we trying to do with this? What we're trying to do is, everybody know Java Reflection? Yeah? And you can ask a class what methods you have, what fields you have, and what can you do? You can call the methods, and you can access the fields and change the fields or get the value, yeah? And what's that really all about is state, structure. There is a bit of behavior because you can say, what do you do, and can I call it? But generally, it's all about behavior. Oh, sorry, state. It's generated by structure. What structure do you expose? What kind of interface structure? And what state structure do you expose? But what it doesn't expose is, we can't ask the JVM today, here's a method, tell me what it does. What does it do? What does it generally look like? What's its average signals? What does it kind of, give me a signature, what this method looks like. And if you knew that, then you can start to create systems that are able to say, okay, I've got observation awareness, now I can start to change myself. Like, I'm going to do a request, and the last time I did this method, I did a database call. So more than likely, or the last 1,000 times I did, it, I did this method, I did a database call. So it's database bound. And this method never does a database call. So I can maybe put him in a different thread pool, or I can schedule him slightly different. 
Or if this guy has gone to the database and the database is already full and everybody else is down there, I can now stop, I can slow him down. Because I know now what he does. Today you don't know it, you just know that the method you can execute it, but you don't know what he does. And you don't know what he is, his callers do and what they do. But with this mechanism, we could do that. So what we want the JVM is to give us behavioral reflection. Very much like in the cloud. Okay, are we okay on that one? Okay, so that's, that's, so we have measurement, then we have ability to ask ourselves awareness of what our software does. And now what we want to kind of do is look at the control aspects. Now why, why do we, the reason for the awareness is for us to be able to do stuff like profile, typically what we're doing now, but also to protect the system. We, we can use the kind of the hooks in that we use for measurement that we can say, well, why not just measure? Why not we can, because we're measuring and we can do this kind of awareness, why not use those control mechanisms to protect the software? Like, stop it from overloading a component. Like, if you know a component is, you know, suffering or is acting up, like a circuit breaker or something like that, don't, it's not, like, if you, Everybody know what a circuit breaker is? You've heard this kind of pattern in, in Java where you know a service is maybe faulty and then you slow down, you maybe put it into a particular state mode where and then after a while if it continues to fault you break the you know you stop the calls going in there. But the problem is that we all still run down to that com component. What happens if you knew already up at the component level at the entry point into your web app that you knew that you're gonna call that component that that component is broke? What would you do? What would you do if you were intelligent? You wouldn't take the request, it can't service at the moment. But what would software do today? It would run down to the component, it would throw the exception and come all the way back up. And what would it do again? What would it do the next time it did that exception? It would repeat it, wouldn't it? It's like Groundhog Day. Oh yeah, that component's broken, let's run down to it. <laughs> throw an exception, caught it. Let's go down again, I caught it, it's another exception. It doesn't change. It doesn't even know where it's going. So I'm just going to keep going because I don't know where I'm going. I just know I'm calling the next guy and I don't know where he's going. So what we need is software to do that. No. Here's another way for protection. You know, we talk about denial of service attack. A lot of people put that kind of mechanism in the network. The problem is it's very hard to see when there's some, you know, there's some situations where it's very hard to determine whether it's a real user or not based on just the packeting, you know, the, the, the filters on the network. And so, but what we have figured out, we have one customer who's figured out that code is the best way to figure out whether someone is a hacker or not. Because web apps have a particular flow. And they know that if the, if the user has executed this piece of code, and the next time he's going to do this type of code. So let's say you, do, you go to a web page and you go book, you know, like you're going to reserve a book and check out. You have a particular sequence, yeah? And that sequence will appear on the server, won't it? And a particular set of instructions will be executed. Now a hacker might just go randomly jump around the pages that are not possible to navigate with. And what we figured out is that if we track users in terms of the code they're executing, we can determine whether there's someone that's coming in and doing behavior that's simply not the norm compared to everybody else. Based on how can he go to that step? This this normal this task is this task is not followed by this task, so they're simply just randomly picking something as an attack point, and so we can use that because we we know every time we do a request we go save point change set store it, then use that as a, as a kind of a key into what the next step should be the next time the request comes in from that user, and if the key does if it doesn't match the next step we could say this looks like, you know something to be observed and then what we can go into is observation mode in that user. And then if it continues to deviate from a normal code execution, even though individually at a request level the code might look right, but over a sequence of steps it looks wrong. And, and apparently chain sets are a way to do that. Another way is policing. We kind of want to police the calls. If the, call, if the user is calling us and he calls maybe 1,000 in a second, we probably want to say, you know, you can keep doing that. I'm going to stop you now until the next second pass. So if someone suddenly starts hitting our system. So what we can do is use this kind of measurement mechanism to figure, figure out whether we don't execute this code again 
for the next second or so for this particular user for this particular thread let's say you have a runaway thread and it's spinning what do you do by the way when you have a thread spinning in a JVM what's the standard what's the standard operating procedure <laughs> kill <laughs> now everybody wants to kill the thread it's like which thread is it I want to kill it how can I kill it can I kill it in JVX the problem is we know that if we kill it we don't know what else is kills because we don't know what state is corrupted there's no way to control it, so we can't kill it. Because someone might need it, or he might throw a stack, you know, an exception up and corrupt state as he's getting out of there. What would we like to do? What would we like if he's spinning? What's the best way to do it? What would we do? Stop. Pause. We probably can't, we can't, we don't want to throw a thread death because it could just corrupt state as he goes up the stack. Because someone hasn't handled the exception correctly. But if we were able to slow him down every time he spins, you know, he's spinning and he's calling something. We said, oh, no, you just call me. Oh, you're spinning. I'm going to slow you down. We can still keep the system running for maybe until we kill it the next morning. <laughs> but that's great. We don't have to kill it during the day. At least we can kill it in the morning. So we can just say, okay, if it's spinning, it's okay. No problem. Morning, get him. <laughs> so policing can give us that mechanism. And we need our software to do that. Say, hey, you're spinning. Uh, if a thread call if this if a thread calls one million calls in a second of the same method, then we, we, we at that method where we're measuring, we go pause, sleep or yield. The system still runs, but at least you know we're up and running. No one's the operation guy is away from the console or the killing. Prioritization where we have particular customers who are pain and non pain and we only want to give people who are pain. So there there needs a way to look at who's coming in and then tell the software as it's running along, this guy goes in the front. In front. Now, I, I had this question d during the, the break, and you were all eating. So, and I don't have time, I didn't cr have time to create a slide, but if you think about JVMs where we're forking a lot of jobs into smaller jobs, you know, break, partition them up, and if we have a kind of a, like a map mechanism where we partition jobs up, you, you, everybody knows What's that, called? What's that thing that Microsoft creates? MS Project, isn't it? You know, <laughs> I've never used it. But, you know MS Project where we have this critical path, where all these jobs are all running, and we can move those jobs, but the critical path can't be changed because that will break the budget, or you know, we have to deliver on time no matter what. Now, what we want the JVM to do with tasks is figure out which is on the critical path, and then move the other tasks, you know, they can move them along the timeline. So don't schedule him now. He's okay, he's a sure task. He could be moved a little bit. But this task is critical. He's on the critical path for this completion of this. So this guy, typically there's an entry point. He goes task, 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 and then he writes them all wrong. And then one of these tasks generally is the kind of the critical path, or he's on, you know, he's, he's the one that uh, drives the performance of the response time, the latency. Now what would we want to do with that guy? We would want him to run and as fast as possible and not to be slowed down by anybody. And within, this trans within these tasks, we probably would say, okay, probably at a, at a global level, we, have, we can't say that, but within a, a kind of a task level, we might say, see all of these other tasks? Well, if they're, if they're all contending for a monitor, I want this guy to get in. Forget about those other guys, because they can be pushed along. Because I've still got this empty space here where he could be put in. But this guy, don't move him anywhere. Let him get everything. And then everybody else has to fight for him, fight it off him. So that's what we want the software to do. But the problem is that the software, the JVM, is all about bytecode. It doesn't know behavior. It can't say that, oh, this task is, going, is the critical. It can't take a, a set of tasks, part of a job, and figure it across a parallel execution, which is the critical one, generally. And which one should I give priority? So when I start to move all of these threads, I would thread pulling and assign them to the tasks, which ones should get pumped up. Of course, we could probably do it with prioritization, but then we have to figure out what it is, and we probably don't know, because that's what we're hoping they do, and we, we can't profile it. So that's prioritization, predicting them. Oh, gee. Oh, my God, this is going to be amazing. Okay, so. <laughs> Are you sure? Like 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, 15. Okay, so what we have been building up to is feedback systems. Observe, judge, react. 
self-regulation. So evidence, collect evidence, collect measurements, determine the relevance of it, consequence, and then take an action on it. Re re reason on it, and then loop again. So this is where we're going to all of these systems where we need observation. Generally, a control system has a controller. Think of like your web app controllers or something. There's a process that feeds the input. There's some kind of disturbance in our environment. Typical disturbance would be JB, uh, the GC cycle, you know, GC kicking in is a disturbance to our process. Uh, scheduling on the CPU, if there's other people on the same box or there's other threads running and they're contending for a job, we might get a disturbance on the general process. So let's say this typically executes in a, a fixed interval. We might not always get that because of the, the CPU might not be available or the, uh, there's a GC cycle. Now what we want to then do is have a sensor. Generally we look at the sensor, the output coming in, and that feeds back into the controller. And the controller uses the output to determine what he should do. An example is we have a, a strategy called auto-tune. And what auto-tune does is says, okay, I'm going to measure probes, and you're going to tell me what the goal is. And so I'm going to pick a method and say, this method should execute always in 120. Like today we have a threshold in our hotspot, but the problem with the, hot, the threshold is, what's the threshold? You know, when do I tell a method is hot or cold, which one should I kill? Or which one should I not measure anymore or disable? What we want to do is, it's probably hard to figure that out, but what we can do is, is look at this job and say, that this method always executes in this fixed time. Now, I want you, when you're measuring it, to increase the threshold until it f reaches that. Okay, so we, we have a probe that's running, he's calling other probes or other methods, they're measuring, and they slow down. We, we, because we're measuring too much, we slow down the system. And we've set a goal. So what the threshold can do is say, I'm going to increase the threshold and cut off some more methods until I meet this goal. Very quickly, uh, to show an example of this, auto to. So we have this kind of application here. Now all it does is there's a job here five, method five. He calls four, he calls three, he calls two, he calls one, he calls zero. Yeah? And then there's something at the bottom. So just think of it as there's, there's, there's a call sequence. There's a call sequence. Now, if we now let's look at the job running without instrumentation. So for running without um, uh, let's just run it without any kind of uh, Let's just run this without instrumentation. So it's one one five. Yeah, that's the normal. Now we're going to run it with instrumentation. So that's that's reporting what five generally is. Yeah. So five. Here's the benchmark. So we're going to say the method five executes on average one one five. Now if we turn on instrumentation. I should have, I've actually turned on the, uh, the, sorry, I should have turned off this first. <laughs> so if we turn on the instrumentation now, without any intelligence, or feedback, it's feedback system, it should get up to 800, because what's happening is we're measuring 5, we're measuring 4, we're measuring 3, we're measuring 2, we're measuring 1. Yeah, the, the JVM should inline all of the methods. Yeah, but they're still, they're still looping, they're still looping. I, I, I think like the, the one, the, the, the five, the, the four, and three, two, the one, yeah. the whole be in line with the top method. Oh yeah, yeah. But what so we want is the profile or a kind of an adaptive system to take the feedback and say, listen, you're not meeting your goal. Yeah, I, I know what will happen in it, but what's happening is once we do measurement, the measurement is changing the behavior. Yes. So, so we we want the measurement system. But the problem with the measurement needs the feedback. It says, what's the goal? Because let's say we don't know what the threshold should be. We don't know where we should cut it off. So what we can say is, well, I want you to make sure, use feedback, look at your behavior, and change yourself. And so what he's going to do is going to enable auto-tune, and he's going to say, there's a monitor. Monitor this method called auto-tune 05, and he should have a threshold, I just said 120. Now what I'm saying is, I want that method to execute within close to 120. If you don't execute close to 120, increase this threshold here which starts at one microsecond yeah so it's going to increase it now if we look at what's happened here in a previous snapshot what we've done is we've measured and let me just do it again just just to see what the uh, turn off I think my 
ってもそらそら I just want to get the show the breakdown of the other methods. I'm just gonna, okay. So if we go, if we look at the this profile, what we can see here, probe each of these. So zero is called one, two, five. It's still enabled, yeah. It's two, three. So five is the one that makes the call. The four, the three, the two. Now, if we tell the system to use a feedback system, which is put the controller in a, a goal, and then to tell him to up the threshold until we meet the goal. And then disable probes that don't make that threshold. What we should get is close to 120 something. Um, I got there 122. What's happened is if we go down to the snap this XML, you'll see that the system decided to disable one, to disable two, to disable three because the threshold increased the threshold of the hotspots until it met this deadline. So get back. That's that's a kind of that's a feedback system, and that's what all our feedback systems should be. We should have some kind of generally in control architectures that you have. You have a controller who controls. Now, how you would do this in your web app is you look at your request going in. Let's take your 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 web app. You should probably try to put a, a, a valve in that says whether I should have, what's my concurrency level on a particular service, and what it could do is measure the service at particular levels of concurrency. And, it's, and then increase the concurrency while, and st while you're still increasing throughput and response, or and hopefully keeping response, response time, you know, at the level, you know, meeting your objective. But as soon as you can increase the concurrency, if the response time grows, what would you do next? You would reduce the concurrency. You would say, well, don't let them all go through because they're slowing down. So what we don't today, we don't know our software. What's the what's the optimal concurrency level? But with this kind of feedback system. The software can control the behavior by observing it and using that to determine, to, to drive the work, whether it slows things down or increases it. Okay, so what we can do then is, is QoS is where we can, every time a method executes, what we can do is apply kind of this kind of what we have is QoS, I don't know if I have time is reservation lanes prior to queuing and rate limiting. Rate limiting is where we say so many per second. Um, and I'm going to show you just a very quick example of that because what we can do is if software is instrumented, why not apply uh, rate limiting? So, uh, okay. okay, we take this app and I'm going to run this app without any QoS. Uh, just to get it, so this is, it's going to run, it does calls every second. So this says it does 840 a second, yeah? Because it's doing some sleeping here or something, yeah? Now, what I'd like to do is tell that software to slow down. So let's say it's spinning. So what I can do is define a service called C. This is what we should be able to do with the JVM and metadata. So here's a method, there's a service, and part of that service is this method. And there's a resource called T, let's just say, and I want to do is every time the service, every time the method executes, it goes to the service and gets a unit. We can put a capacity limit on if we want. But basically the, the, the thread goes and says, oh, I'm executing call, he has a resource called T, I go to T and ask for a unit. It's, by default it's one unit, but you can have a dynamic unit. And then what happens is every time he gets called, he's gonna ask for a unit. Now what I've done then is said, there's a resource called T, and I'm going to rate limit it. I'm going to say only put 10 units in this resource every 100 seconds. So it's a depleting resource. It's a resource where I'm filling up something and then the thread comes in and takes it out. And if I control, if I can control the filling, I can control him. Because he can't proceed unless he gets the unit. It's like a pyramid. Think of it as pyramid, the semaphore, yeah? Okay. Well, if I apply it now, what, what should we see? Uh, how many calls a second? It's either 10 or 100. Which one do you think it is? <laughs> now, I've not changed the code. It's running the code again. What's happening now? If you see the output, it's 100. So what I've done is I've been able to use a configuration to control 
the execution of my treads and say, I want to slow this tread down. And why are, we, why are we doing that? Because we're already measuring it. If we're measuring it, that's the control mechanism where we can, at the measurement point, we can say, why not control? Look at what we're doing and say, hey, there's no units, I don't proceed until I get it. Everybody, everybody understand what I've just done there? I've changed the config, like if I change this to, to 10, just changing, no code, it's still running the code. Oh, um, what did I change there? Interval. <laughs> Uh, right now, I think I need to. Which one was it changing? Uh, put that in. Oh, no, sorry. You want 20? Then intervals, yeah. 200. Yeah? <laughs> so I can just change code. I can stop code spinning. I can slow it down. I can even let. Okay. Now that's the control, uh, come on. So what we want is tools in the JVM for observation and, and controlling. This is called, comes down to it, there's a, there's a kind of a research area called uh, uh, system dynamics. And basically, uh, you know, a lot of systems can be explained with that way, where we create services. Remember I created the service and a resource. Typically that's in system dynamics is, you have a stock, think of it as a resource, and you have a service, which is a kind of an inflow or an outflow. And so something gets like, if we talk about population, births increase the stock of the population, and then deaths decrease it. And there's always, of course, there's a balancing loop where deaths are decreasing what's in the stock here, and then there's a reinforcing loop here where the more births we have, the more the increase in the birth rate itself, yeah? And of course, the deaths go there, yeah. So what we want to be able to do is we want the JVM to come up with a new way of doing resource management where we create these kind of logical soft resources that are used to control. See, today we're writing Java util concurrent, yeah? You're creating all your queues and all. But what would be a lot easier if we could describe our system in terms of services and resources and then say to the JVM, weave this code or this configuration into the application itself at these services. So we identify service we have in terms of the probe name, and then we tell it the resource it needs to get. Now, how can I control the system? I can say that if I can take over control of any thread by just creating a logical resource, it could be named X, and just say there's a capacity one, and then, or two, and then I've controlled the number of methods that can execute that by simply a configuration. And that's much easier than you going off and writing Java util concurrent code. So the JVM could weave that in, and of course underneath it will be semaphores and priority queues, but that's what, that's what we can do. So what the future will be, take your application software, take your system dynamics model where you define these resources and services, very logical, in configuration, and you control your software. You can say that I don't want, this, this job is always a long running job or is a heavy in the heap. I only want two of them ever to be executed at a time. And you can do that. Okay, this is finally faster. I think you can do stuff. <laughs> I had lots of other stuff. But okay. Okay, getting back to to faster performance. So we're we're going with the JVM to other than just the observation then is we want, so we've got all of these thousand cores, but we don't know what to do with them. Now, if, uh, does anybody know uh, curling? You know the, 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 the sport, I don't know if it's in the Olympics this year, but curling is where, great. <laughs> curling, are you ready? So curling is where you throw something along an ice, a stone, I think they call it a stone, isn't it? And then someone in the front, what he does is, he has a sweeper, they call sweepers, and they sweep along the floor in front of the, on the ice, and what they're doing is making the surface smooth so the stone will keep the momentum or keep moving. I don't know if they use that to change the direction, probably if it's going off a bit, they might skim it a little bit higher and move it over. Now, so, what we need to do, so how can we go faster? Everybody wants to go faster, but we can't because the hardware is not getting faster. Uh, so how are we going to take a job? So Google says users expect things to be faster. What, how, what's the way to do it? 
predict. Why is Google search faster? Because as soon as I start typing, it's starting to predict what I want to get next. Yeah, have you ever done the search and then it like already gives you, your, it's like, okay, you know where I was going. So what our software needs to do then is, is that we know that this, there's one job here. We can't make this faster anymore. We've reached the limit with the JVM and with the memory, the, with the hardware barriers. What we can't do is, but we have all of these other processors and they're doing nothing. But what they can do is, they can look at a job running and figure out what's going to come next and maybe get the data there. Because when your manager goes to you and says, says, can you do this job and say, I've got it done, it's already dead. I've done it. That's as fast as anybody will ever get because you predicted it. You said, I knew what you were going to ask and I've completed it already. Completing some sentences. So what we need, need to do in the future is to have the software use its observations to predict ahead and could get the data, could get all of these sort of cores to do something useful. And that would be, so we're going to use more processing power, but we're going to shorten the length of the job because what's going to happen here, normally he would be waiting for something to load, the data will already be there. When he gets to the job, it's like, it's there. It's like you already, it's like when a user hits a web page and you know the next web page. You probably know next is going to be hit. Why not already have it ready? So we're, kind, we're already kind of, Probably some apps are already doing that, but we have to do that in terms of our software. So that could mean, especially with data grids, is having the data already local, predicting needs and already getting it there. I kind of have a little bit where we tried to do this before with databases where we're kind of putting the data together. Like data that's going to be accessed, we put it together with other data. We're kind of already saying that we know the particular access paths, which is kind of prediction. So we know that when we go to get that record, that normally we would already have the other records loaded because they're in the same kind of block. But what we need to do is get the other software is observing a job running and figuring out whether it needs some assistance along the way and making sure that's resolved. And that might be clearing out something ahead. It might be signaling ahead. I had lots of other slides, but <laughs> we'll have to do them in the pub. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.